you know, the, your levels. So my talk will be sometimes in a very kindergarten level, sometimes it will be quite advanced level. Uh, so I'll try to, you know, uh, go in that way because, you know, as I said, some of you might be relatively new, some of you might be quite advanced. So to fulfill all uh, not the people here, they will, uh, they sort of a purpose to come in here, so my talk will be in that kind of uh, varieties in the terms of the levels. Um, yeah. So the now we'll start uh, this first session, and uh, as you know, uh, it is quite uh, important not only when we come together at this kind of gathering, but also uh, in our day-to-day -day life, in our everyday activities. When we enter into activities, physical, verbal, and mental, uh, our routine activities, such as making a cup of tea, answering the phone, and, and so forth, uh, to up to this kind of spiritual activities. It is extremely helpful to uh, enter into these activities, engage in these activities with the right positive mind. And that is very crucial. You know, when I say right positive intention or the mind, I'm not talking about a particular uh, positive, a constructive mind. I'm talking about you know, a positive mind, a constructive mind. That can be a very, very simple, straightforward, common sense, positive mind, or that can be spiritually, philosophically, motivated, positive mind. And that is up to the individuals. Basically, we all have, we all have, have the ability, have the potential, have the seeds to experience many layers, many levels of positive minds. There's no doubt whether you are Westerner or Easterner, male or female, black or white or color, you know, uh, 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 ordain or lay. We all have the potential, have the ability to, to experience, to hold many layers of positive, constructive mind, whether we are educated, or not educated, whether we have a spiritual path to follow or not. And that is real truth. You know, the only thing many of us keep ourselves extremely busy and take for granted that positive potential that we have and all the time either uh, postponed, procrastinated, saying I will do it later, tomorrow, next month, or next year, or after I retired. <laughs> Therefore, we, uh, uh, you know, the, we, we do not familiarize experiencing, holding that, those positive mental states. And that is really something uh, whether we have any spiritual path to follow or not, really something important to bear in mind and try to hold positive minds, thoughts, emotions as many times as possible during the day, at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, at the beginning of the event, you know, and that way 
will see the, the benefits, the usefulness of having you know, experience you know, these positive minds, thoughts and emotions. And that is a part of what in the Buddhist term or in the Eastern term they call meditation, Bhagavan in Sanskrit, Tibetan Gong. So that's good, yeah, that's good. So the really to to experience, to experience, to hold uh, some of these positive potential seeds that we have, we don't need profound philosophical understanding. We don't need sophisticated philosophical understandings. Although some of those profound, sophisticated uh, philosophies are useful to go more depth, to explore more depth in our, you know, the uh, mental world. But, uh, you know, the, what we need in our day-to-day -day life, uh, particularly in our this kind of very, very busy, demanding uh, lifestyles, what we need is we need a simple, straightforward, calm, clear, positive. That kind of mind can be experienced without that kind of profound, sophisticated philosophy. Just simply to hold positive minds. Like, for example, I, will, I usually say this as, a, as an example. In the morning, beginning of the day when we woke up just you know to spend one or two minutes one or just spend one or two minutes not longer than that thinking today you know the fifth of May two thousand seventeen Friday I'm going to spend my day you know I'm going to spend my day I'm going to use my body, speech and mind, you know, minimum, minimum intentionally not harming others, you know, intentionally not harming others. If it is possible, if I get chance, you know, I will try to support others, well beings, others, you know, the well beings as much as I can. So that, that kind of that kind of mind, to hold that kind of mind at the beginning of the day, we don't need deep philosophy, reasoning. Why and why? We all can understand that. And we all know the benefits of having that kind of mind. So the you know the that kind of thing, something simple, straightforward, common sense, positive mind, to, to, to start the event, to start the day, to start the activities. Then of course, of course people who have some uh, deeper philosophical reasons, like for example to come here this evening, to listen talk, contemplation, what is said, and at the end, if there are questions, ask questions. So, you know, thinking, I'm going to participate in these activities, then use your deep philosophical reasons that you have. Or some kind of spiritual purpose, like some of you may come here, because you follow uh, teachings of the Buddha. The teachings of the Buddha. You have taken the teachings of the Buddha as a your spiritual path, spiritual journey. And because of that, you want to you know, to explore further, learn more, to 
benefit to yourself, to benefit to your spiritual journey, and you know, the, uh, through that, uh, being able to support, being able to support other beings. So some of you may come here because of that reason. And if that's the case, make it very, very clear from your from our heart, I'm here to participate these activities for that reason. What is what is useful, what is helpful is that kind of positive intention, what level that you want to uh, hold, common sense, simple, or some kind of you know, deep philosophical reasons, or profound spiritual reasons. What is useful is, you know, hold that intention from our heart as genuine as possible, as sincere as possible. Not in a form of uh, mimicking, uh, you know, uh, not in a form of because it is because it's, it is said uh, so, not in that way, just you know, from our heart. So try, try uh, all our best to hold a positive intention to join uh, this evening's uh, gathering. So we will stay just for a few minutes in sun during that sun period. You know, try to hold that positive intention. So with this positive and constructive intention to join this evening's gathering, now we will do a short sun meditation. A short sun meditation. The purpose of this meditation is very, very simple. Simply to experience, to experience a calm, clear, and focus mind, mind which has uh, which has qualities of stillness and the quality of clarity. So the purpose of the meditation is for that reason to enhance, to promote these two qualities, stillness and clarity. Okay. Stillness in the sense of that our minds 
have the ability, ability to stay with the one given meditation object. That can be your natural breathing, or it can be you know, the image of Buddha. It is up to the individual what object that you want to choose. The stillness can be enhanced, can be uh, further developed when simply without any conceptual thinking, you know, without any that kind of discursive mental activities, simply placing our mind on an object, not your natural breathing, or sensation at your nostrils, or the warm feelings under your hands, or some, something which mentally constructed, like image of Buddha, or just simply the mind itself, mind itself, without any particular content, or with the content, like strong sense of compassion, strong sense of love. You know, that, that, that's up to the individual, but it is useful to have a particular object, although there are traditions, not necessarily, you know, advocate, say, to have a particular meditation object, you know, instead of that, just simply to stay at the present, whatever comes, just observe without any, you know, judgment. There are that kind of traditions, but here, um, what, I, what I follow, a tradition saying it is useful to have a particular meditation object. What object it is up to the individual. And what you have to do, just simply your our mind stay that object. And that way what you will do, what you will experience, will experience the mental quality of stillness. Stillness. That means our mind not easily be uh, sort of you know scattered or be moved to different objects. So that's the first thing. When there's a stillness, then it is useful to cultivate quality of clarity. Clarity in the sense of when the mind is with the object of the meditation, say you are breathing, your mind is fully aware the breathing. The full attention is on your breathing. Again, without any judgment, without any discursive analysis or anything like that, simply be fully aware of the object of meditation. So these two qualities, stillness and clarity, are going to enhance during this short silent meditation you can you know i can see all of you have a quite you know good sitting posture have a, a, a comfortable you know comfortable uh, you know, constructive sitting posture then choose the object of the meditation when these two stages are done then simply place your mind on the object of the meditation through that enhance the stillness. When the, your mind is with the object of the meditation, then enhance the clarity, to, that means to raise the awareness. So when these two qualities are present, stillness and the clarity are present, then simply, you know, your mind simply be, or, you know, be with that, or, you know, just uh, without any kind of uh, further expectation, simply be with that, these two qualities, stillness and clarity. In that way, we will be we'll able to experience a calm, clear, and focused mind. So we'll do just about seven, eight minutes sun meditation.
to you still. <laughs> I was, uh, I'm not saying I'm a, I'm a great meditator, but uh, I've been trying this last, I can't remember since when, but still occasionally I struggle with sitting posture. So I can understand, so make yourself comfortable. Now next, uh, 20, 25 minutes before we have a short break, and, you know, the, I'm going to talk on the topic, but as the background of the verse, Tantra practice or the Russian practice. I think the background, understanding of the background is extremely useful instead of going straight away to the narrow on the topic. As, as you know, in your Western, culture, Western education system, you have a you know, system, great system to uh, uh, to explain the, the say the particular uh, particular sort of, uh, philosophy or particular theory like social theory or you know the science, scientific theory uh, all those are explained the the background of how the social theory is developed, under what circumstances the social theory, like for example, Marxist, why the Marxist theory, uh, the concept is developed, is developed under the particular circumstances during that period, and uh, you know the, 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 the theory is developed, and it is the same, you know the all these different spiritual traditions, including <coughs> Buddhism, within the Buddhism, Theravadan Buddhism, Mahana Buddhism, Vajrayana Buddhism, whatever, all these different, you know, uh, what's called the traditions, they're all developed under the different circumstances, different backgrounds. And that understanding is very, very crucial. So, in this first part of the, our talk, discussion, I will just talk to you in a few uh, important background uh, of the Vajrayana practice. Now first and foremost important background uh, that we all need to be aware of, uh, quite often as I used earlier, the term we take for granted we don't pay that much attention, uh, and it, that, that is, I think, very important for us to all these uh, different spiritual traditions uh, and so forth. They all are designed. They all are developed, you know, to fulfill humans' needs. You know, the humans' needs. We all have some kind of natural yearning, longing to fulfill our yearning wishes, you know, the whatever that we have. All these different traditions are developed, you know, they come into being, come into existence to fulfill that we all naturally have that, you know, the yearning to be a happy human being, and that's why, you know. And I think that 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 background should not be ignored. Not as a community, not as a you know. In this case, I'm not talking about in a wider perspective, but as an individual. I, as a human being have this, you know, the yearning naturally there within me. Nobody taught me, nobody sort of forced me to have that yearning. Regardless of different culture backgrounds, we all have that yearning. 
you know that whether you are Westerner, Easterners, or born in 2,500 years ago, Buddha's time, or the 21st century, you know that using laptop and you know the, all those finger things, I don't know what to call it, you know. We all have that. And all these different cultures, different spirit traditions are designed to fulfill that. Of course, you know that having a different sort of time and different social background, different sort of all those things, some spiritual traditions are different from other spiritual traditions. And that's the case for the Buddhism. When Buddha, his talk with Buddha Gautama, was in India more than 2,500 years ago, it seems there were already many other spiritual traditions in India, and I'm sure other parts of the world. You know, a part of the world. So, the historical Buddha taught his teachings under that background. He didn't teach his teachings completely empty background. There's nothing, and he invented everything. No. He taught all his teachings in a that kind of background, already quite a rich, sophisticated varieties of spiritual traditions already there in India. Although we don't know, because there were no written record, and a written record started more than four or five hundred years after Buddha passed away. You know, so therefore, we, we, you know, we can't say accurately, you know, that what kind of sophisticated teachings were there at the Buddha's time, but it, it, you know, it is, it is, it is. Nowadays, it is quite clear there were already many spiritual traditions that they need, and that is also quite important for us to to know, because when we talk about with teachings of the Buddha, and particularly our topic, you know, Buddhist Vajrayana teachings, many of the aspects, te uh, I mean, the practical aspect of the Vajrayana practice, many of the, you know, the recitations, many of the different deities aspects are very similar to some of the non-Buddhist ancient Indian practices. Just recently, I was in India, just you know, uh, end of April, from 18th to 20, 23rd of April, I was in India in uh, in Varanasi. And Varanasi, as you know, Varanasi is one of the richest, you know. Uh, spiritual sort of environment for thousands of years in India. And I was there. And uh, one morning, me and one of my friends, and uh, around five in the morning, we took a the car to went to see uh, uh, the, the Adi uh, Puja, that fire offering uh, in, uh, near, uh, in Kandak. You know, the, you know, God, one of those guys. And uh, it was, I mean, I've seen this before several times, but this time, because of the, uh, the what you call the time, uh, there were uh, there, there were not many tourists. I mean, there were many people, local people, there were not many tourists because of the heat, hot, and climb, so forth. So me and my friends got a good chance to look around all these different, you know, the practices. Of course, we spend quite good time to actual earthy, you know, offering, fire offering. And my friend who came with me, he lives in 
Varanasi, uh, I mean, the Tibetan Institute, he's expert in Sanskrit, and he's able to translate all the mantras they were chanting while they are making the fire offering, while they are making the water offering, while they are making the, you know, the what's called the air offering. And it is almost exactly the same that we say when we practice in an intimate when we practice Buddhist Vajrayana practice. You know, there's hardly any difference. Then when we finish the you know the the uh, the puja, then we walk around, then we saw there was a fire puja, and it is almost exactly the same. Only small the no difference are those small things, and this is almost exactly the same. So, that is what here, you know, the, it is useful to know the background. Otherwise, we will make it, you know, misunderstanding, and all so on and so forth. So, uh, so the first background is we all have this yearning, longing at the Buddhist time up to the 21st century. That's the one background we all should be aware of that. To fulfill that, that, that kind of yearning for thousands of years, all parts of the world you know, have developed many different things, including 21st century. You know, all those things. That was also part of it to fulfill our human needs. Yeah. So that's the first background we need to be aware of. When we engage in these things, it is quite useful to, for what purpose, for what reason that I am you know, taking this in the boat in my life. I mean, one of my friends said some time ago, you know, they're coming to the West. Although already, you know, in my in my uh, what called the in my baggage conceptual baggage already full of things. Most of our very not very constructive, and coming to the West and living in the West now twenty six or twenty seven years, and uh, you know he said you have more you know extra baggage in my head, and I think I I, I agree with him. <laughs> he was he was very honest, and uh, yes, that's true. I have all the Eastern Tibetan monks' baggage in my brain, in my head, and on top of that now I'm living in the West 20-something years, and now the Western baggage. Most of them are not that much constructive, just simply collected, 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 collected. You know, just collection. So the, the reason why I'm collecting is also because this deep down there's a something, oh, I may need this in the future. <laughs> this, this yearning, you know, the longing may need something in the future, so that will cut it here. But uh, just connecting here, not fulfilling that yearning, is the problem. Just collecting, you know, the ticking the box. I have this, I have this, I learned this, I learned this, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but not really got down to the heart level to fulfill that yearning. And that is the reason one, uh, that's the reason why I'm saying we should be aware of the background, why we are collecting these things. Okay, so that's the first. Second background I've just had briefly touch on. Buddhist Vajrayana teaching, you know, is developed up to the present time, more than 2,500 years ago, 
under the background of already in India before Buddhist, Buddha historical Buddha taught his teaching, already sophisticated varieties of spiritual traditions were already there. And that's the second background, really important to, to know. Right? Now, the third background is more specific, the teachings of the Buddha itself. And that is really not that straightforward, not that straightforward. Within the Buddhist traditions have arguments back and forth. Many of the teachings of the Buddha one tradition, spiritual traditions, think taught by the Buddha, other spiritual traditions say, no, 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 that Buddha didn't teach those things. So there are also back and forth arguments. Let alone Buddhist Vajrayana teachings, even the non-Buddhist Vajrayana teachings, some of the Mahayana teachings, not Vajrayana, Mahayana teachings, are also, you know, there's this disagreement whether these are taught by Buddha or not. For example, you know, the most important groups of teachings in the Bodhisattva and the traditions, in the Mahayana traditions, you know, the Panchaparamita Sutra, Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, you know, according to the uh, Bodhisattva and the teachings, according to the Mahayana teachings, we think we believe these are the teachings of the Buddha, the history of the Buddha. But the Taiwanian traditions, they say no, the historical Buddha didn't teach these sutras. So there are these arguments. This is not 21st century arguments. Those arguments have exist for a long, long, long time ago. There are lots of, you know, the debates who agree or disagree those things. So those are the things. This, having disagreement is not necessarily bad. Sometimes having disagreement is good. You know, having disagreement may produce productive results. If the disagreement is resolved constructively, that is important here. And that, in, that includes the Buddhist Vajrayana teachings and practices. As I just said, many aspects of the Buddhist Vajrayana teachings and practices are almost identical with the modern Hindus practice and, you know, the aspects of Hindu's practice. So, many of the Buddhist traditions say, no, those are the not Buddhist teachings, practices. So, having just that kind of disagreement, we don't need to be surprised. Being a human, hum, uh, being a human being, disagreement is bound to happen. Within the small family, two couple loving each other very much, I know there are disagreements. Even what, what we are going to eat in the evening, at home, you know, what furniture we are going to buy. You know, that's the human nature. That's human nature. So we don't need to be surprised, we don't need to be shocked if there are disagreements saying that Buddhist Vajrayana teachings are not taught by the Buddha. You know, you don't need to be surprised. What is important is trying to understand behind these you know, different aspects, a different uh, sort of activities. What is the essence the Buddhist Vajrayana teachings are taught or teach us? And that is really something important. Yeah. Now, 
that's the one thing I find quite useful, you know, when I talk to, because uh, I have several good Theravadin uh, friends, Theravadin monks, very good friends. Some of them are quite senior monks in Thai tradition and in Burmese traditions. And occasionally we have this discussion, you know. And sometimes it is very, very, you know, nice to have that kind of disagreement. And it, because in having that disagreement, you have chance, you've got chance to talk, to share, to explain. Also, you can have a chance to listen what they are saying. What are the, their main reasons? Because in the past, we don't have that kind of interaction. And we will oh, they say, well, our, our practice is just rubbish, and it's not talked about the can meeting all these people are very nasty, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Lots of things in our head, but not real face-to-face -face discussion. But when we have face-to-face -face discussion, disagreements are understandable. So that's a really, I find very, very helpful to, to, uh, to have that kind of, you know, the opportunity to share, to talk, you know, to... So uh, anyway, the, the first thing that is, uh, we don't need to be surprised if there are disagreements among the uh, Buddhist traditions, which teachings are taught by Buddha, which teachings are not taught by Buddha. Now then, Another point which I want to make is this. It is clear, it is clear when the historical Buddha, Gautama, after his enlightenment under the Bodhi tree in Bodhgaya, then he taught almost 40 something years until he passed away age 81 in Kushinagawa. North India, his uh, the, the the duration of you know uh, the what's called the, uh, the, or the period that he <coughs> had to teach almost forty something years. What is some not just a week, not just a weekend. <laughs> Nowadays we do, but forty something years. And although not flying from America to India, but going around around the Ganges, River Ganges, from north to south, traveling, maybe occasionally, you know, uh, riding a bull cart, I think most of the time walking with his, you know, some mountains. But 40 something years. So in that kind of period of time, you know, the, and meeting, encountering many different people, not just small group of people, many different people. These are quite, you know, the nicely explained in the, some of the sutras, you know, the, the, his, uh, the different peoples that he had encountered, some of it just ordinary people. There was a very nice story. One time, uh, he was approached by a lady, lady who lost her only child, and she was devastated by that loss and completely, you know, distorted by that and. She approached the Buddha. Buddha was mourning, going to his arm to get his you know, lunch. And she approached him and she said, I lost my only son. And the Buddha's you know, the approach, how to deal with that lady's devastation, was very, very interesting. He didn't teach immediately to her, he just said, just go to the town. The town is relatively big at that time. It is, you know, she, he said, just 
go to the town and go to the every single house. Every single house and ask them, is there anybody passed away from this house? And she did exactly what he said. She went every single door and asked, is there anybody passed away from this house? And she couldn't find a single house to say no. Every single house has a say yes, somebody passed away. Just that itself helped her to 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 heal that grief she was experiencing. Because she she felt that's the only her you know, experience losing her loved one. Anyway, that's the story. So Buddha had approached. So my point is this. The teachings of the Buddha, the historical Buddha, is not just one set of teachings. Variety sets of teachings. Because of the time, first of all, 40-something years, he had chance. Because of the encountering many different people, different mental dispositions, different mental capacities. So if we think about all those things, then we can understand, yeah, why not? Why not Buddha, the historical Buddha, you know, didn't teach all these varieties of teachings? And that's also very useful to to, to bear in mind as a background to understand. Okay, so shall we have a short break? Yeah. Uh, tea break. We'll come back. Yeah. Ten minutes, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. We'll come back quarter to eight. This time I want to start to say, as I mentioned in the end of the previous session, you know, the, the historical Buddhas, the, the time, the period that he had to teach is rel relatively long, 40 something years. And uh, on top of that, you know, the meeting, encountering many different people from very household to you know very uh, learned people, so the, you know the, that is also one thing to to bear in mind. And all, now to hear the Buddha himself, some of those uh, common teachings, common to Theravadan as well as Mahayana, some of those common teachings uh, stated, uh, saying you know the. Teaching the Buddha gave his teachings according to according to the listeners, followers, 
mental dispositions in Tibetan Kandam Nerva Nasopa. Kandam Nerva Nasopa. Kam is dispositions, Nerva is aspirations, different aspirations, different mental dispositions, and the different circumstances. The teachings are given by the historical Buddha on that basis. And that is clearly stated in the common teachings. Buddha taught his teachings, taking into account these things, uh, uh, varieties of mental dispositions, varieties of aspirations, and varieties of social backgrounds. And under that situation, he taught his teachings. And that is really something useful, helpful to remember. You know, to remember. And uh, another thing, you know, the, quite often uh, the, in the Buddhist culture, in the Buddhist tradition, the historical Buddha is, uh, is called Tapkala Tujijin. Tapkala in Tibetan, Tapkala, that means having amazing skill, skill to teach, skill, amazing skill he has to teach, to jijin, that means same time he has a great heart, if I use the common language, otherwise, you know, the compassion. So that is one of the, you know, the, how Buddha is called, Tapka Dhamma to jijin, you know, the teacher, who has that kind of qualities, skill, skillful, and a great heart. So this skillful is important in here, our discussion. You know that if he is skillful, of course he will not teach the teachings which is not suitable to the people who are not ready. That is the skill, you know. So that those are the things that we need to bear in mind. Bear in mind. Now then, going a little bit narrow uh, point, you know, the one of the 17th or 18th century Tibetan master, great Tibetan master, he used an interesting, very, very interesting expression to look at the teachings of the Buddha as a whole, you know, as a whole. And he used this expression saying that um, I'm saying this in Tibetan because it is recording. So in the future if somebody listen who knows Tibetan, then they know what is exactly what I'm saying. Because many of my how I translate, I translate in a very simple language, not in a, you know, that kind of academic language. So sometimes people get confused what I'm saying, in, you know, if I don't say it in Tibetan in the future. Mm -hmm. People who listen in the future, who knows Tibetan. That means, you know, the teachings of the Buddha can be divided into two categories, into two categories. This by this Tibetan, 17th century Tibetan teaching. The first category he called Dhamma Chisen. That means teachings for the general. Teachings for the general public. And that is Dhamma Chisen. Dhamma means teachings. Chisen means for the general public. Kansa Gu Chen. Some teachings are given to the individuals. Kansa. Bhutan means individual. Teachings given to the individuals are not necessarily suitable to the general public. So that is really something nice to try to understand the varieties of the teachings that are given by the Buddha. I mean, generally, we use, say, the Theravadin teachings, Mahayana teachings, 
Vajrayana teachings, these are the commonly used to say the, you know, the, uh, the apparatus of teachings taught by his Toki Buddha. But uh, this one, I find it's very, very nice. This, you know, this master, he said, teachings of the Buddha can be located in two categories, teachings for the public, general public, teachings for the individual person, you know, individual. And the Vajrayana teachings belongs to the second category. Vajrayana teachings belongs to the second category. Not the first category. It belongs to the second category. Because if you look at the teachings of the Vajrayana, Vajrayana teachings, these are given, most of the Vajrayana teachings are given to an individual person and the historical Buddha himself, not in a form of an ordained monk, but in a form of particular deity. So that is, to me, if historical Buddha appeared to me in a particular deity, I will run away. <laughs> I will say, no, this is not historical Buddha. This is not the Buddha that I'm, you know, the, I was supposed to be receiving teaching, I will run away. So that is the something which is important to remember. In the Vajrayana teachings, you know, the, the, te the teacher, the, 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 the topic, that initiation, the teaching that is given by the, what is called Gingorji mm, Taho. The owner, owner of the mandala, owner of the sort of, you know, the, the lord of the mandala, or the, the principle of the mandala. Mandala is the, you know, the circle of deities. Circle of deities. So in, within the circle of deity, the principle, the lord, is the historical Buddha. But not in a monk's form, but in a particular that date is form. And that is not suitable. That kind of teaching is not suitable to the general public. As I said, if I were in that kind of situation, I would run away. Because my mind is not ready. For me, historical Buddha means an ordained monk. Okay? So that is really something I find it's very useful to remember why, you know, uh, 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 to remember these great teachers are able to see the teachings of the Buddha in these different categories, saying there are teachings that historical Buddha taught, not to the public, but to the individual, individual person who is ready to see, ready or able to see the historical Buddha in this particular form, not in a ordained monk form, you know, like, uh, like, like that, I'm not sure Buddha is like that in, when he was in, <laughs> in, the, in India. <laughs> some, some, some years ago, I think 2000, 2008, late 7, 2007, early 2008, early 2008, uh, I led a group of Westerners uh, to pilgrimage in India. And uh, I did this three times. The last time was 2008. And uh, we spent a few days in different places where historical Buddha, you know, uh, was born, where he taught, where he spent lots of time teaching in all those places, including that place called Krishnagara, where his Dr. Buddha passed away. And uh, we spent three days in that place. Not very attractive place, but a very nice place. Very nice place. And uh, 
I think that sometime in March, already quite hot that part about. So what we usually do, morning, as much as we can, go to see the places, and during the day stay in an air-conditioned room, and then again in the evening as much as we can before dark start to see the different places. So one morning, while we were there, uh, three of us, me and the two other Westerners, we left quite early from our hotel towards the side where his historical put a, uh, his body was committed. Uh, and there's a big pile of what we call stupa. And we were approaching towards that. And a quite a relatively long distance, a tall, relatively tall, you know, slim old guy approaching towards us, quite long distance, and the sun's, you know, on that road, that man is, and in my head, suddenly, suddenly, without any reason, suddenly I thought, hmm, historical Buddha, 2,500 years ago, historical Buddha, when he was around this area, he might be look like that guy, quite tall, slim, and age around eight one, you know. That guy, you know, his body was quite, you know, straight but slim and old age. Sure. So the, the, somehow it just clicked in my head. Although I don't know how he looks like, you know, but uh, that's anyway. The, my point is, I don't think he's talking about it looks like like that when he was in India. That's my main point. <laughs> but anyway, I'm not saying that's wrong. Mm -hmm. So. So the, uh, the point is, point is, you know, the, 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 uh, when the historical Buddha taught all these teachings, taught all those teachings, and these teachings are, you know, taught sometimes as individual, for the individual, and sometimes for the public. And it is inevitable, it is inevitable, the teachings which are taught in the public are more recorded, more recorded in the sense of verbally like that, and teachings which are taught to the individuals, they stay in individual. And sometimes survive, sometimes disappear. And that is the nature, isn't it? So the, uh, I found that's, that 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 uh, that uh, description was very very helpful uh, when I when I read that text that Tibetan teacher's text. Mm -hmm. Now the second thing, now next point of what I want to make here as a background to be aware of these different teachings, which you know. Uh, attributed to the Buddha. Some of the teachings like the Four Noble Truths, 37 aspect of the Enlightenment, uh, there, are, uh, there, there are many which are common. When I say common, common in the sense of Theravadan tradition as well as minor tradition agree taught by historical Buddha. You know, so they are called common, tmoma, in Tibetan common, common in the sense of there's no disagreement. Although in the, you know, nowadays written in Pali, written in Sanskrit, and then later translated into uh, Tibetan, into Chinese, some versions are slightly different here and there. For example, the, the Buddha's, the first teaching, the Four Noble Truths. Written in Pali, there are two or three different versions. And written in Sanskrit, also there are two or three different versions. And uh, what is written in Pali is not the same as what is written in Sanskrit. So these are, there are these varieties. But core structure, the core topic is the same. Order is slightly different different words, number, and so on. So these are what we call the common, common teachings, including code, um, monastic code of conduct, 
you know, the, uh, in the in the Tibetan tradition, you know, like in Burma, Sri Lanka, and so forth, have in the Thai they have monastic code of conduct, and also the Tibetan. Slightly different numbers here and there, otherwise almost the same. So these are common. Another important thing which is common is teachings uh, of selflessness. This is important. Selflessness, anakuma in Sanskrit. And sometimes it is translated in English emptiness, but the selflessness might be better in this particular case, anatma. That is common. In the, the common in the sense of both traditions, Theravadan tradition and Mayana tradition, agree. There's no disagreement whether they're taught the selflessness or not. Both agree to the taught selflessness. Of course, when it comes to detail, what is selflessness? When it comes to philosophical detailed explanation, then there are differences. That is inevitable. I know this very well. You know, when I was with my teacher in the monastery, Sarah Monastery, uh, those days, 15 or 16 of us, almost 14 years to go together to receive teaching from this teacher. But when we come out from the teaching, and when you go to the Tibetan yard, we all have different views what he said. <laughs> you know, this is not in you know, the decade past or century past, it is just for you, you know, in the afternoon around 2.30, and the debating, yeah, debating start in the evening around 6, 6.30, 7. So we all have a different understanding of what he said. So I'm not surprised you know, that when it comes to explain in the Theravadan tradition what is selflessness, go into more detail, and what is selflessness, go into detail in the minor tradition, but that's not surprising. But both agree. But this one is very important. Important to our topic. Buddhist Vajrayana practice. Another important teaching which is you know considered as common uh, which is common commonly accepted taught by the Buddha. Compassion, karuna, not karuna. Karuna or the compassion or uh, great compassion is the essence of the teachings of the Buddha. Essence of the teachings of the Buddha. In certain extent, entire his teachings, the historical Buddha's teachings, are built on the basis of compassion. How he taught and what he taught is that place. And that is really another important one. Both Theravadan and the Mahan traditions agree the core teaching of the Buddha is compassion, cultivation of compassion. And that is also useful and important for the, you know, the tomorrow that we talk on the, how the Buddhist Vajrayana teaching is different from the other Vajrayana teachings and practices, other tantric practices and teachings. Those two, selflessness and compassion. Those two are the common teachings, common to common in the sense of Tanvadin, as well as my both agree core teachings of the Buddha. Okay? So uh, that's important to, to remember, uh, to pay in mind. Now, then, go a little bit narrow. Uh, now, I'm, 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 look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, from the Mahana 
from the minor traditions, from the minor traditions, uh, the historical Buddha, the historical Buddha's teachings are divided into three categories. Three categories. Three categories are called the first turning turning of the will of the Dharma. The second, the second turning of the will of the Dharma, and the third turning of the will of the Dharma. So in other words, there's a group of teachings called first turning of the will of the Dharma, there are a group of teachings called second turning of the will of the Dharma, there are a group of teachings called third turning of the will of the Dharma, according to the Mayan. Theravadin will not say that. Okay? That doesn't mean they are wrong or we are right. That doesn't mean we are wrong, they are right. This is how over the you know hundreds or hundreds of years how this is developed. Now this first, the second and third should not be understood as a, a what you call the mm, uh, kono, kono, no, period. Not in the first, second, and third, in the sense of the teachings which are in the first turning of the world of the Dharma. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at my English. Yeah. Not, not, uh, you know, not in that sense. It is simply to understand you know, the different subjects, the first, second, and third. It's not according to the time. It is just according to the subject matters. Subject matters. Hmm? From the Mayana, according to the Mayana traditions. All the common teachings, common to the Theravadin and the Mahana, both agree as taught by Buddha, are in the first turning of the will of the Dharma. Second and the third are the purely Mayana business. <laughs> You know, so sutra, sutra, that term, sutra, that term is not English, it is Sanskrit, or in Pali, sutra, so in Sanskrit, sutra. So sutra, in, 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 in Buddhism, of course, the, the, in uh, Hindu, Hinduism and uh, Jainism will also use that term. Sutra, because it's common language. Sanskrit is common language. So, according to according to the Buddhist tradition, when the term sutra is used to explain the scripture, that means that scripture is taught by Buddha. When they say sutra, according to the Buddhist tradition, you know, according to the Jainist tradition, I think when there's a sutra. That text, that scripture, is taught by the founder of the Jain tradition. So that is the difference. Otherwise, you know. so third, second, and third, you know, uh, teachings. All those sutras are the Mahana sutras, not the Theravada sutras. So why I am saying this? Because to talk about Buddhist Vajrayana teachings, we need to understand this. If we don't understand this, then where the Buddhist Vajrayana teachings comes from? And that's why I'm saying these things. So, when the, you know, the second turning of the will of the Dharma and third turning of the will of the Dharma, both groups, are Mahana sutras, but the topics are different. The topics are different. Second turning of the will of the Dharma, all those in that group is called, I mentioned earlier, Panja Paramita Sutra, Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. And the main topic the main topic in that Perfection of Wisdom Sutra is emptiness. Main topic or implicit topic is 
emptiness. Third turning of the will of the Dharma, the sutras belongs to the third turning of the will of the Dharma, are also Mahayana sutras, but the main topic is emptiness, but emptiness is slightly different from what is taught in the second turning of the will of the Dharma. Also, in the sutras which belongs to the third turning of the will of the Dharma, one of the main topics is nature of mind nature of mind. And that is really, really relevant to the Vajrayana teachings. To the Vajrayana teachings. The nature of mind. The nature of the mind is clear light. That topic is mainly comes from the sutra belongs to the third turning of the will of the Dharma. So His Holiness the Dalai Lama says very often, if we really trace back the origins of the Buddhist Vajrayana teachings, the origin we can trace back to the sutras that belongs to the third turning of the will of the Dharma. And that is what here it is useful to understand. That. To understand Buddhist Vajrayana teachings and practices, we need to understand basic human and nature of human minds. Nature of human minds. Nature of human emotions. Nature of human thoughts in a more depth. Although, you know, the uh, in the Abhidhamma texts, the texts which are common to the Theravadin and the Mahayana, there are lots of explanations about the minds, their functions, their cate different categories, different you know, the activities. However, there are further explanations which is not found in the Abhidhamma text, which common text to the Theravadin and the Mahayana. The further explanation about the mind, thoughts, emotions, and more detailed, more subtle levels of the mind, which are not mentioned, which are not taught in the common teachings. Because that is the main part of the Vajrayana teachings and practices. To, to follow the Vajrayana teachings and to engage in Vajrayana practices, individuals need to understand some of the deepest levels of human mind, the nature of human mind, the function of human mind. Because many of Vajrayana practices, meditations, are designed, designed to touch, to touch, to, to touch the, the basic, basic nature of the mind. Sometimes it is called, you know, the fundamental, the nature of the mind. Different term terminologies are used according to the different sources. You know, for example, there is a terminology which is used in Tibetan, say, Rigpa. And in the Nyingma tradition, they use quite often that one, Rigpa. Yeah, you know, the awareness, pure awareness. Or in the, in the Guruk tradition, tradition that I follow, the term will use union of bliss and emptiness. So some of these basic, basic human men, uh, mind, nature of the mind are sort of utilized to practice through the Vajrayana meditations. So that is what here this 
particularly the sutras belongs to the third turning of the will of the Dharma. Some of those sutras really touch on this topic, the nature of the mind. So therefore, you know, the having understanding the, the, the teaching through the Buddha is divided into these three categories, first, second, and third, is quite helpful you know, to, to look at that. Okay, now, now we have five minutes. If I have a question, or more questions, <laughs> or you are completely exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> How many people have received Vajrayana teachings? Raise your hand. Okay, quite a good number. How many people, this is first time to come to the Buddhist class? One, two, three. Okay. You may find quite, you may get lost. <laughs> you may think, oh, I might be better, better off staying apart. To have it. <laughs> so, anyway, you know, the <laughs> uh, some time ago, some time ago, I think maybe eight or nine years ago, I joined, I joined a course. Uh, yeah, anyway. Join the course and he managed to finish. And the course was designed for eight uh, evenings, uh, Tuesday evenings, and uh, I managed to go only three. After third evening, Tuesday evening, I thought, that's it, I'm not going back again. <laughs> <laughs> because it's very, very difficult to follow that course, so I give up. So some of you may find that very difficult to follow what I'm saying today. But the human way of learning, you know, somehow our, men, our, our mental capacity to learn, generally speaking, I mean, I'm sure there are some exceptional cases, generally speaking, our men, mental capacity to learn is, you know, through bit by bit, not all in once. That doesn't work our mind. Our mind works learning things from bit by bit. You know, like those jigsaws which children play with it, putting the things together. That's how our minds learn things. Not all in once. You know. So yeah, anyway. Is there any question? And so far, what I've said. No? Yeah, okay. And there are two first you go. Yeah. Just now, which sutras tell about the nature of mind according to the third? Mm -hmm. What did you say? And so, our uh, question is what, what are the, those sutras in the third turning of the world of the Dharma talk about nature of the mind? Something like Chan Sutra uh, in English. Is translated saying uh, unraveling the thought. Uh, there is also Sutra uh, uh, Tathagatakarpa Sutra, essence of the Buddha. Uh, there is a Sutra called Dodhisattva, the tenth. Bhumi Sutra, Tenth Grand Sutra. There are several sutras which touch on this topic, the nature of the mind. Yes, uh, you said earlier that the historical Buddha adjusted his teachings out of three aspects, which um, one of them was uh, social background. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain why you think he adjusted okay. from that? For example, I will, I will give you one example. At his time, as well as the 21st century in India, caste system is very, very big social background. You know, it, it creates lots of lots of problems in the 
past as well as the present. Buddha clearly said, clearly stated, he said, in his tradition or in his teaching, caste is not important. So his followers, you know, when he ordained some of the lower caste, other traditions, they very vigorously criticize. So the and also another cultural background, social background is not, not just him but also Jainism, the founder of the Jainism. Because that time there were there were stories, you know, almost all the what's called the uh, buffaloes and cows are sacrificed, killed. And farmers are struggling to have animals in their field because of this tradition to sacrifice. And Jainism strongly, you know, insists not harm any. So these are the really the culture background. And the Jainism, the founder of the Jainism and the Buddha are the contemporary. Maybe a little bit, you know, the Buddha might be 10, 15, 20 years earlier, or a little bit earlier, or I don't know exactly. Then, if you look at the background of the uh, culture background of, you know, the, uh, where he travels, most of the, the places where he travels around the River Ganji. And it seems those days, most of the people dwelling people are they around that river country because the water source resource and uh, you know all those things and uh, another culture background that he you know the if you look at some they're in next to a quite big cities those days because in, then you know the, there are more opportunity to teach so those are the, some of the cultural background, social background. Uh, another quite interesting social background is his own cult social background. Himself, although there are debate whether he came from a royal family or not, but it was quite clear he came from quite well of family. And then he abandoned everything. Entire his family and abandoned and went to search this spiritual and this is very interesting at that time and i think even these days some some part of india those seekers they call it seekers spiritual seekers are very very important part of the society you know they're very very important part of society i mean sometimes misused that important you know, the power, but in general, very important part of the society. So he again, you know, the, if you look at in that kind of background, his own background, culture, social background, is quite interesting. Okay, you know, here in the in the West, I found similar to um, uh, Saint Francis in Italy. You know, the Assisi Francis mm -hmm. abandoning his rich in the family and going to search these kind of things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you were uh, talking about uh, the distinction between uh, common and personal mm -hmm. kinds of teachings. Mm -hmm. Has it been controversial to bring certain teachings to the West, for mm -hmm. example? Or? I won't say it's a controversial. I think it is important to be aware of the person who is explaining those, either the you know the, the teachings which are quite uh, not for the common, not for the public. If he or she wants to explain that that group of teachings to the public, he or she should be fully aware of the risks as well as the benefits. Not just to himself or herself, but to the public who are listening, 
also for the teachings. It is said, you know, why in the 17th or 14th and 15th century, why Mahayana Buddhism was completely, you know, wiped away from India, there are two reasons. Although we don't know exactly, but there are two reasons. The first reason was, of course, there was a Mongol, you know, the, uh, movement. They destroyed all many of those big institutions. Second reason was because in the Mahayana tradition at that time, there's a strong Vajrayana elements of teachings and practices, and that part was quite badly corrupted. Therefore, public lost trust. Like you know, what happened in the, in the West, in some of the you know, like a recent situation in Ireland, you know, the, uh, a few months ago I read an article, article based on uh, a group of university students that did a uh, censor in Ireland. Since uh, this controversial you know, the situation, uh, the priests, how they abused the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the people whom they care, the Irish people, you know, the believing or Irish people paid in Christianity was dropped quite rapidly. It is not from outside like communism or coming and saying you should, but it is inside. And that is also, it said, why the, you know, the Buddhist Mahayana tradition was completely, you know, disappeared in, in India, in that part of India, around 12th, 13th century. It is one of the reasons is public lost the trust, because this, there's a Vajrayana element which is not properly used. So this some of those teachings given to the individual, if we try to bring to the public, and the person who is bringing to the public and the people who are participating, both have to be fully aware of the, the benefits as well as the risks. That's it, yeah. Okay, now we need here to save energy for tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so we started with the, you know, the, with the, with a positive intention to join, and now we'll end the event, this evening gathering, with another positive thought, and uh, traditionally called dedication. Dedication. It is a mental state, genuinely, sincerely. In thinking from the heart, whatever virtues, whatever wholesome is there from my this evening's in you know, participating in this gathering, all those virtues, all those positive results, I will genuinely offer or dedicate for the well being of not just myself, of course, oneself well-being of oneself is important, but also try to think well-beings of many, many living beings. And thinking